Chapter 4 The Body Piezoelectric I'm deeply sure that we will never be able to understand the essence of life if we restrict ourselves to the molecular level. A surprising subtlety of biological reactions is stipulated by the mobility of electrons and can be explained only from the position of quantum mechanics. Albert Cezant Gorgaye, Nobel Laureate, 1968 Electricity and magnetism are at the foundation of medicine, ancient and modern. Electrical pulses from heart pacemakers regularize the heartbeats of tens of thousands of cardiac patients. Electromagnetic devices like MRIs, EEGs, and EKGs allow doctors to scan the insides of patients' bodies without resorting to risky or invasive surgery. The effects of electrical shocks were observed by the Greeks and Romans more than 2,000 years ago. In his dialogue, Minno, set down around 400 BCE, Plato described a superfying electric fish, the torpedo fish, that lived in the Mediterranean Sea. His near contemporary, Aristotle, observed that the torpedo fish would narcotize its prey. In 100 CE, the Roman writer Pliny also commented that the torpedo fish, while not sluggish itself, would induce stupor in other fish, and described how to extract the medicinal ingredient of the torpedo fish into oils and ointments used for various ailments. Piezoelectricity is one of the most fascinating forms of electricity, and one that is essential to the understanding of the mechanisms of healing. Piezoelectricity is generated by mechanical means. When pressure is applied to certain structures, they polarize into positive and negative electrical poles and generate electricity. A common application of piezoelectricity is the lighter in your home barbecue or a modern gas grill. When you turn the knob on your grill to the light position, you will hear a clicking sound that sound is a ceramic plate being struck by a metal pen. The ceramic material is piezoelectric in response to mechanical stress, and it produces an electrical spark that ignites the gas used in the burners. The first documented use of piezoelectricity was by the UTE Indians who lived in what is now the American state of Colorado. They created hollow rattles made of buffalo hide into which they inserted quartz crystals. When the rattle was shaken, the quartz crystals struck each other, creating a mechanical stress that generated a piezoelectric discharge in the form of light. The light shone through the translucent skin of the rattles during sacred ceremonies thousands of years ago, these rattles would be shaken and would glow in the darkness of the Colorado night, calling the spirits into the sacred circle. Marie Curie was the first woman in France to receive a doctoral degree. She and her husband, Pierre Curie, discovered the medicinal effects of radiation and coined the term radioactivity. Together with Jacques, his brother, Pierre Curie first demonstrated the effects of piezoelectricity in 1880 by showing that many different types of crystals generate minute currents of electricity when subjected to mechanical stress. Marie's medical research, leading to the development of practical X-ray machines, was facilitated by her husband's development of sensitive piezoelectric measurement devices. Pierre and Marie Curie received the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903 for their work. 
Marie also later received a second Nobel Prize in 1911, becoming the first person to win or share two Nobel Prizes. The First World War saw the first large-scale application of piezoelectricity with the development of sonar. Developed to track submarines underwater, sonar devices employ the piezoelectric characteristics of quartz crystals sandwiched between two steel plates. When current is passed through the plates, the quartz crystals produce a sudden motion that results in a sharp chirp being sent out underwater. By measuring the length of time it takes for the echo of that chirp to bounce off the hull of another vessel and return to its point of origin, the sonar operator can determine the distance of the other vessel. As the distance changes over time, the sonar operator can also determine the other vessel's speed. The success of sonar a century ago prompted intense interest in and development of piezoelectric devices. Among them were phonograph needles, microphones, and television remote controls. The piezoelectric principle is used today in thousands of advanced applications, including echolocating units in some new cars that sense the distance between the bumper and an approaching object and sound a proximity warning alarm. So what are gas grills, car electronics, and Indian rattles doing in a book about the link between consciousness and your cells? The answer's simple. The human body is also a piezoelectric generator, and some of the structures in your anatomy have as one of their primary purposes the conduction of piezoelectricity from one part of your body to another. Energy is the currency in which all transactions in nature are given or received. When you sign up for a massage and lie on the table, having your muscles stroked, you're having a direct experience of physoelectric effect on the human body. Any kind of mechanical stimulation of the body creates physoelectricity. This includes not-so-pleasant sources of piezoelectric stimulation, such as banging your shin against a table while navigating a dark room. Either of these experiences creates a piezoelectric charge in the cells surrounding the point of contact, and a piezoelectric current that travels along the most conductive channel available within the body. Many kinds of tissue in our bodies have piezoelectric properties, including bone, actin, dentin, tendon, and our tracheal and intestinal linings, as well as the nucleic acids of our individual cells. Tendons and ligaments are part of the connective tissue system. Sheaths of connective tissue surround every organ in our bodies and the connective tissue system encases and joins all the other structures. Via it, information is continuously flowing through your body in the form of electromagnetic currents. Although there are many varieties of electromagnetic activity that are being generated by our cells, as well as electromagnetic fields affecting the body from the external environment, Piezoelectric induction is an important method of cellular signaling used in the body's internal environment to receive and transmit information. Electrical Medicine in Western Science The link between electrical currents and healing has been recognized for centuries. The term electricity was coined by William Gilbert in 1600 in his book De Magnet. A few decades later, electricity was being artificially generated, stored, and transmitted. Stephen Gray, in the early 1700s, showed that some materials were better conductors of electricity than others. Another Stephen, Stephen Hales, applied this insight to physiology, speculating that nerves might conduct electricity within the body. 
It was not long before adventurous researchers began to apply electricity to medicine. In 1753, Johann Schaeffer published Electrical Medicine, the first book on the subject, and Luigi Galvani demonstrated in 1786 that static electricity generated outside the body could be conducted through the nervous system to produce the contraction of a muscle within the body. In the 1830s, Carlo Matucci demonstrated that injured tissues generate an electrical current, and in 1868, Jules Bernstein first described bioenergy in which positively charged ions generate electricity as they move across cell membranes. He discovered that negatively charged chloride ions cling to the inside of a cell membrane, while positively charged sodium ions cling to the outside of the membrane. When a nerve receives an impulse from an adjoining synapse, the polarization reverses momentarily. Now this change of polarization ripples down the axion like an electrical current transmitting energy from one end of the neuron to the other. However, the chemical nature of this exchange led scientists toward chemical explanations for the body's signaling systems and electromagnetic signals that occurred outside the well. Understood mechanisms of the nervous system began to receive less experimental scrutiny. One of the 19th century's most influential researchers, Emile dubois Raymond, constructed a device to demonstrate the effect of electricity conducted through nerves on living tissue. A species of fish known to emit electrical impulses was wired to the nerves of a frog's leg. When the fish generated a current, the frog's leg twitched, pulsing a lever which rang a bell, history's first example of a biotechnology machine. The application of electricity to medicine accelerated in the 20th century in 1902. A Frenchman named Le Duc reported that he could narcotize animals with a current of 35 volts AC at a frequency of 100 cycles per second. In the United States, however, the 1910 Flexner Report castigated electromagnetism in medicine as irregular science, stunting its exploration and development. Meanwhile, in Europe, progress continued. In 1924, Wilhelm Endhoven, a Dutch physicist, won the Nobel Prize for his discovery that the heart generated its own electromagnetic field. At that time, measurement of the heart's field required the use of the most sensitive instruments available. Today, scientists are able to detect electrical and magnetic fields millions of times fainter. In 1929, Hans Berger, using progressively more sensitive galvanometers, was able to detect and describe the brain's electrical field. The heart has by far the strongest magnetic field of any organ. It's about 5,000 times stronger than that of the brain. Berger's work contributed to the development of the electroencephalogram EEG, which maps the electric field of the brain. Later, the magnetic fields of the heart and brain were mapped by magnetocardiograms and magnetoencephalograms. In the 1960s, Robert Becker, M.D., demonstrated improved regeneration of limbs in salamanders after stimulation by an electrical current. This work was later applied to humans, where it was shown to reduce the time it took for bone fractures to heal. In the 1970s, Nobel laureate Albert Signet Gigori reminded scientists that molecules do not have to touch each other to interact 
energy can flow through the electromagnetic field. He was also impressed by the subtlety and speed of biological reactions and proposed that proteins may be semiconductors. This was in sharp contrast to the prevailing view, which focused research on mechanical and chemical interventions like drugs and surgery, and sneered at the possibility that invisible energy could be affecting cells. Electromagnetic energy is fundamental to living organisms. Certain strains of bacteria orient themselves to Earth's magnetic field. They've been shown to contain microcrystals of magnetite, a black mineral form of iron oxide. Particles of magnetite are the smallest magnets occurring in nature. Small crystals of this magnetic substance are present in the brains of certain animals that require the ability to orient to Earth's magnetic field, such as homing pigeons, bees, and migratory fish. Magnetite was discovered in human brain tissue cells in 1992. It occurs in linear chains of up to 80 crystals, often attached to a membrane. Magnetite microcrystals have been linked to our ultradian and circadian rhythms. We demonstrate this effect every time we fly a great distance and experience jet lag. As our body's circadian rhythms adapt to a new diurnal pattern and our personal electromagnetic field has to adapt to its new location on Earth's electromagnetic grid. Minute electromagnetic changes can cause the brain to produce norepinephrine, a neurotransmitter involved with the stress response. The more we look for electromagnetism in nature, the more we find it. Images from GPS satellites available on Google Earth have recently allowed researchers to determine that some large mammals like cows also have the ability to sense Earth's magnetic field. Cows will orient themselves to magnetic north. At high latitudes where the geographic pole and the magnetic pole are far apart, they orient toward the magnetic pole, not the geographic one. It is possible that humans have some similar ability which could explain probable navigational feats like the ability of Tahitian navigators to outrigger canoes to paddle their way across 5,000 miles of trackless ocean to Hawaii. On his first voyage to Tahiti in 1769, the British captain, James Cook, picked up a Tahitian guide named Tupia, where the mariners traveled subsequently even thousands of miles away Tupia was able to point correctly in the direction of Tahiti, whether it was day or night, a feat that Captain Cook could only repeat after using his sextant and compass. When water is exposed to magnetic fields, then examined using infrared spectroscopy, it demonstrates reduced hydrogen bonding and other minute changes in its molecular structure. In a seminal series of experiments by Bernard Grad, Ph.D., of McGill University, these same molecular changes were demonstrated in samples of water on which healers had performed the laying on of hands. Grad performed scores of experiments on seed germination and plant growth over many years. He found that when seeds were watered with the water that had been held by the healer, they grew significantly faster and larger than those that received water that had not been held. He wondered if the reverse effect might not also be true. So he compared the growth of control groups of plants with the growth of plants given water that had been held by patients being treated for psychotic depression. Sure enough, the plants irrigated with the unhappy water demonstrated very little germination and significantly slower growth of those seeds that did sprout.
Grad later confirmed similar effects of the laying on of hands in the healing of cancers and wounds in laboratory animals. Grad's experiments were later replicated and extended by other researchers. They provide a foretaste of more recent experiments showing that the fields generated by the hands of healers exhibit the same frequencies employed by electromagnetic healing devices. Therapists practicing Qigong and other forms of energy healing have been found to emanate large electromagnetic fields from their hands. Siba Gaigi, a giant multinational pharmaceutical company, patented a process to create genetic mutations on fish eggs using only electrical fields using their process they were able to grow trout having distinctive hooked jaws that had been extinct for 150 years both mechanical generators of electromagnetic fields and human ones can produce fields with epigenetic properties a report from the U.S. National Institutes of Health states that bioelectromagnetics essentially underlies biochemistry in that chemical reactions of biological importance are mediated by electromagnetic force. Electrical and magnetic signals also initiate protein folding and regulate DNA. A recent report from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, reviews 25 years of research in electromagnetism to spell out the precise cybernetic mechanisms by which cells harmonize their activities. It states that cells rely on a low-voltage electromagnetic circuit to transmit information, whereas they use a chemical circuit to transmit power. The weight of evidence for this role of electromagnetism in biology is overturning the prejudices embodied in the Flexner Report and the century of suspicion that it engendered for the role of energy in medicine. The history of medicine provides us with many such cautionary reminders of how hostile skeptics, more interested in reinforcing their prejudices than in healing, can slow the adoption of therapies with a robust base of evidence and delay the day when their benefits are available to suffering patients. Pulsed Electromagnetic Field Therapy One of the most recent therapeutic uses for electromagnetism in healing is the use of pulsed electromagnetic stimulation, PEMS. PEMS machines deliver timed magnetic pulses at calibrated strengths and have been successful at treating a wide variety of ailments. PEMS has been successfully demonstrated in more than 2,000 studies to be useful for treating arthritis, depression, hypertension, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, osteoporosis, pain, inflammation, and Parkinson's disease. Magnetic fields also appear to enhance the ability of diseased or damaged cells to utilize oxygen, thus speeding their recovery. The increased oxygen absorption may be linked to other effects of PEMS stimulation which is the patient's report, decreased pain almost as soon as the field is turned on. A magnetic field affects all cells within its range. It travels through bone, beds, and plaster casts. Magnetic fields seem to work by affecting the electrical charge of cells. A normal cell has an electrical potential of about 90 millivolts. An inflamed cell has a potential of about 120 millivolts, and a cell in a state of degeneration may drop to 30 millivolts. By entraining the electrical fields of the cells within range to the magnetic pulses emitted by the PEMS machine, cells can be brought back into a healthy range. 
not only are electrical changes observed in individual cells, they are observed in collection of cells in organs and in whole organ systems. In training the electromagnetic field, intrinsically interwoven into the fabric of the system, assists in the signaling process of large numbers of cells in a coordinated healing process. Diseased cells show differences beyond their electrical charge. The biological software of invasive cancers, for instance, begins to produce an increasing number of glitches. They show an increasing degree of mutation in the DNA sequence. In the words of a cancer research team at the University of Illinois, Chicago, there is a consensus in the field that increasing genomic deregulation also appears to be paradoxically associated with increasing malignancy among the most invasive and metastatic tumor cells. The genetic profile of cancer cells begins to deviate more and more from that of healthy cells along with their electrical charge. In certain types of brain cancer, epigenetic deviations are responsible for more tumors than DNA mutations. When the protein sheath around the DNA does not replicate properly, tumor-fighting genes are silenced, and healthy protein formation is as important as healthy gene formation and points again to the importance of epigenetic control of the DNA replication process. One study reported on the results from 16 medical centers using the PEMS to treat depression in 300 patients who had been unresponsive to SSRI drugs such as Prozac and Zoloft. Patients sit in a special chair for 45 minutes per session while magnetic pulses are directed at the parts of their brains linked to depression. Some 45% of the patients in the study experienced relief from depression using this method. Magnets have shown themselves effective in many kinds of therapy, but until the discovery of magnetite in the human brain, there were few credible explanations of why magnetic therapy produced improvements in a wide range of medical conditions, including tendinitis, blood circulation, diabetic neuropathy, bone cyst, hypertension, optic nerve atrophy, facial paralysis, and fracture healing. Robert Beck was the first to realize in the 1960s that charts of the oscillations of Earth's magnetic frequencies looked a lot like EEG readouts from human brains. Earth's predominant resonant frequency, called the Schumann resonance, is 7 to 10 cycles per second, or hertz, with an average reading of 7.8 hertz. This frequency is also common to the EEG readings of humans and many animals. Beck performed experiments with healers from various regions and religions, including Amazonian shamans, Hawaiian kahunas, Christian faith healers, Indian yogis, and Buddhist lamas, and showed that, at the moment of healing, that their brainwave frequencies were virtually identical. Beck discovered that the dominant brainwave frequency of sensitives, such as shamans and healers, comes close to 7.83 hertz, and may at times beat in phase with the earth signal, thereby causing harmonic resonance. Before and after the healing moment, the EEG scans of healers looked typically of ordinary states of consciousness, but during the healing state they all shifted to around 7.8 hertz. It didn't seem to matter from what spiritual tradition the healer hailed they believed in deities ranging from Kuan Yin to Jesus Christ to White Buffalo Calf Woman. Yet, they all appeared to be tapping into a universal frequency of healing 
that is effective regardless of the belief structure of the healer. Exposure to certain frequencies can trigger positive or negative stress and effects on our immune systems. Electromagnetic pulses can alter the production of cortisol in the adrenal glands. When people are removed from the normal 7 to 8 hertz background fields by placing them in specially shielded rooms, their EEGs, mood, and diurnal day and night neurochemistry change. The thyroid, pancreas, and adrenal glands are all affected by these EMFs. Other experiments have shown that when human beings are removed, from these shielded rooms, their normal circadian and ultradian rhythms can be restored by exposing them to 10 hertz fields. Human physiology requires contact with Earth's field in order to regulate itself. Human DNA has a frequency of 54 to 78 gigahertz or billions of cycles per second. Plant DNA has a frequency of 42 gigahertz and animal DNA, 47 gigahertz. The frequency of human DNA is now being used by some clinical electrostimulation devices, relieving pain in cases that have been unresponsive to conventional drug therapy. These gigafrequencies of human DNA may be developed in medical technologies of the future. An excellent and informative survey by researcher Lean Rothy, Ph.D., of over 150 studies of healing energies, some of which measure the electromagnetic energy emanating from the hands of healers, found that more than half of them demonstrated a significant effect. Rossi believes that the ubiquity of healing practices across time occurs because healers in many different cultures developed and utilized many different worldviews and belief systems to deal with essentially the same question. How can we use human consciousness, psychological experiencing, and our perception of free will to communicate with our bodies in ways that facilitate healing and well-being? It seems that shamanic healers discover the secret of aligning themselves with Earth's frequency a millennia ago which makes electromagnetism one of the earliest forms of healing, as well as one of the newest in forms such as PEMS machines. Electrical medicine in direct observation. In the 1950s, a German scientist named Reinhard Wall began to take careful measurements of the electrical charge at different points on the surface of the skin. He discovered that certain spots had a lower electrical charge than others. Vol's instruments revealed that these points of electrical difference correspond with amazing fidelity to the acupuncture meridians described in ancient oriental medicine. It seems that the ancient practitioners of oriental medicine, which boasts a 5,000-year-old pedigree, possessed the sensitivity to derive purely by observation, a map of the energy pathways in the body, similar to one demonstrated by modern scientific instrumentation. Acupuncture is a practical healing application using the electromagnetic meridians these ancients discovered in the human body. Studies show that Points on the meridian have much lower electrical resistance, averaging 10,000 OHMS at the center of a point, when compared to the surrounding skin, which averages a much higher 3 million ohms. Among other characteristics, acupuncture points propagate acoustic waves better than does the surrounding skin. They will also emit small amounts of light and greater amounts of carbon dioxide. When the points are stimulated with a low-frequency current, the body responds by producing endorphins and cortisol. 
When they're stimulated with a high-frequency current, the body produces serotonin and norepinephrine. When the surrounding skin receives the same current, these neurochemicals are not produced. Other studies compare the stimulation of acupoints with stimulation of areas close by that were not acupoints. And one of these studies showed that stimulation of the correct acupoints in people under stress resulted in a lowered heart rate and a reduction in anxiety and pain. Another showed that depressed patients were helped by meridian stimulation with an amazing 64% reporting complete remission of their depression. This indicates that something beyond the placebo effect is at work when meridians are stimulated. Other clinical experiments bear this out, as well as many accounts of amazed Western physicians. Isidore Rosenfeld, M.D., writing in Parade magazine, recounts the following story. In 1978, I was invited to China to witness an open-heart procedure on a young woman. She remained wide awake and smiling throughout the operation, even though the only anesthesia administered was an acupuncture needle placed in her ear. Studies with a new generation of fMRI machines are illuminating some of the changes in the brain that result from acupuncture, especially the role of the meridians in reducing pain and producing anesthetic effects. Vall's discoveries of the electromagnetic properties of meridians led to some powerful clinical applications. In the form of a diagnostic technique called electrodermal screening or EDS, EDS or bioresonance machines, are sensors that measure the electrical potential at different points on a patient's skin. They are common in Europe, though rare in the United States due to continued skepticism in the medical profession about the link between healing and electromagnetism. Vall and those who developed later applications of his technology discovered that patients who were exposed to an allergen, a toxin, or pathogen would show a change in the electrical fields of their skin. Bernie Williams, Ph.D. of Holos University, an institution on the leading edge of energy medicine education, has done extensive research on the electrical characteristics of the meridians. He's found that the epidermis and dermis of the skin provide channels of heightened electron conductivity, which are experimentally measured as electrical conductance at acupuncture points on the surface of epidermis. Such channels can be theoretically present within the mass of connective tissue which might be associated with the transport of electron excited states through molecular protein complexes. The study of acupuncture meridians thus brings us full circle back to the semiconductive proteins first proposed by Nobelist Albert Zazent Gigori in the 1970s. EDS practitioners typically have a patient hold a vial of some substance to which they may be allergic. Readings from the machine show whether an allergic reaction is registered. By having patients pick up and put down dozens of vials containing many common allergens, a profile can be developed of which substances may be triggering a harmful reaction. Some machines, like the advanced on-demand models are capable of then sending a compensatory frequency back into the body to counteract the effects of the toxin. The efficacy of on-demand machines is now being explored by leading-edge physicians at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Spotting Disruption Before It Becomes Disease an interesting characteristic of EDS devices and several allied technologies 
is that they can detect future predispositions to certain diseases before they become manifest through physical symptoms. This predictive capability of energy readings was first noticed by Yale University psychiatrist Harold Saxton Burr, who began studying the electromagnetic fields around animals and plants in the 1930s. He found, for instance, that the electromagnetic field of an adult salamander is present in baby salamanders and may even be detected in salamander eggs. Even though the egg is round, the outline of an adult salamander can be seen in the field. When a salamander limb is detached, the electromagnetic signature of the limb remains intact. This led him to other experiments in which he found fields around many other organisms. He also postulated, based on 20 years of experiments, that disruptions show up in the electromagnetic field a long time before they manifest as concrete pathologies. Our bodies give us many signals of disease to come, long before they manifest. A 2004 study looked at levels of C-reactive protein in angry people. C-reactive protein is a stress-related protein. It le its levels rise dramatically in the body in response to inflammation, and it is considered a marker for future heart disease. The subjects in this particular study were all physically healthy adults who did not show any symptoms of heart disease. They were measured for levels of anger and depression using widely accepted standardized tests. The researchers then compared the levels of anger in the subjects and the levels of stress protein in their body. They found that the angrier subjects had elevated levels of stress protein in their systems and were at higher risk for heart disease, even though no symptoms had yet shown up. If our system is flooded with stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol for a few minutes, in response, for instance, to a near collision with another car on the freeway, the incident quickly ends as a biochemical event. However, if we hold on to resentments and emotionally painful thoughts for extended periods of time, the very biochemicals that are meant to save us during an emergency become toxins. Long-term exposure to cortisol and other stress hormones has a host of bad effects. It suppresses immune response, reduces bone formation, decreases muscle mass, reduces skin elasticity, and damages cells in the brain responsible for memory and learning. If, on the other hand, we quickly release our stress and return to a biochemical baseline. We restore normal cellular operation, and that's vital to our longevity as well as our health. The same precursor hormones are used by the adrenal cortex to make both cortisol and DHEA. Just as cortisol has negative effects long term, DHEA has positive effects it has protective and regenerative effects on many of the body's systems and is believed to counter many of the effects of aging. Harold Saxton Burr not only suggested that diseases show up in the patient's energy system before manifesting as symptoms, he also believed that physical diseases could be treated by restoring balance to the energy system. A more recent experiment measured the electrical charge of the uteruses of a group of women. The researchers found that the uteruses of women with uterine cancer had a negative charge, while those without cancer had a positive charge. The negative charge in many tumors is assisting in the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer and other diseases. Conduction is also different in healthy organs and unhealthy ones. When a current is passed through a healthy organ in one direction, the electrical resistance exhibited by the organ is measured. 
the electrodes are then reversed and in a healthy organ the resistance is the same in an unhealthy organ however the resistance will change besides their value in diagnosis the electrical fields have great value in treatment as well a meta-analysis of fifteen studies of the effects of electrical stimulation on the healing of chronic wounds found that taken as a group the wounds of the subjects exposed to electrical stimulation healed 144 percent faster than those that were not indeed one audacious series of experiments by a french doctor jacob de demonstrated the effects of electromagnetic fields in a novel way increased secretion of histamine increases heart rate rather than administering histamine itself beneviste simply exposed a beating heart to the electrical frequency of the histamine molecule and by doing so speeded up the rate of contraction next the electrical signature of atrophine which decreases heart rate was applied to the same heart and it reduced the flow of blood in the coronary arteries just as the organic compound would have done the electromagnetic signatures of the compounds were having the same effect as the compounds themselves at one point to silence his many critics beneviste recorded the signals on a computer floppy disk in paris and mailed the disk to colleagues in northwestern university in chicago after unwrapping the package and performing the experiments the american researchers found that the effects of the signatures on the disk were identical to effects produced on the heart by the actual substances themselves other experiments have measured the electromagnetic signal of dna molecules in a vacuum the dna matter is then removed however the vacuum still retains the imprint of the dna's vibrational signature dna regeneration as favorite movie a team of russian scientists led by peter garev of moscow's quantum genetics institute claims to have furthered beneviste's work they scan healthy tissues with a laser and record the wave patterns of the photons the light waves emanating from the cells they then convert this information to a wideband wave signal which they refer to as a dna movie this wave signal is then beamed at an organism either close by or at a distance it activates similar programs in the organism's stem cells and induces them to differentiate and develop into the same kind of cell as the healthy tissue from which the signals were created they tested their dna movie theory in a series of three experiments with rats they administered to the rats a lethal dose of a toxin called alloxin which destroys the pancreas the pancreas an endocrine gland with several vital functions a primary one being the production of insulin in the control group which did not receive the healing signals all of the rats died of diabetes within four days the experimental group of rats after their pancreases had been compromised by alloxin were exposed to the wave frequencies of a healthy pancreatic tissue from newborn rats of the same species the waves stimulated the stem cells of the sick rats who proceeded to regenerate their pancreatic tissue now the experiment was first performed in moscow after which it was replicated in toronto and then in the nisahu Novgorod. in the three experiments ninety percent of the rats had their pancreases restored advances in the development of high fidelity acoustic and optical receivers and transmitters open up exciting new possibilities for cell regeneration 
without the unpleasant side effects of physically cutting and splicing tissues. Ultrafast cellular communication through coherent light. Living tissues emit light. Biologists scoffed at this phenomenon when it was first discovered, and skeptics still hotly contest it. The Russian embryologist Alexander Gerwisht first reported photon emissions from living tissues in the 1920s. The principal biophoton researcher in the last half century, Fritz Albert Popp, discovered a wide spectrum of photon emissions from living cells. His work was cut short, however, when he was unceremoniously ejected from his university appointment at the University of Marburg in the late 1970s. His lab shuttered and his equipment seized. Orthodox biologists at the time regarded the possibility that cells emit light as preposterous and unworthy of research. Pop went on to found the International Institute of Biophysics in Neuss, Germany, in 1996, which is now the largest of some 40 scientific groups working on biophotons. Biophoton emissions have now been discovered in many different animals and plants and many different cell types. Using an instrument called a photomultiplier, which allows detection of these very low-level light emissions, biophotons have now been observed emanating from liver, heart, nerve, lung, skin, and muscle cells. Virtually all organisms studied thus far emit biophotons at rates ranging from a few photons per cell per day to hundreds of photons per organism per second. Distressed and diseased cells emit significantly more photons than healthy cells in close proximity. Researchers have measured the emissions of biophotons from cancer cells at four times the rate of healthy cells making photon detection a potentially useful source of information about the disease. Gunter Albrecht Buchler, a biophysicist at Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago, exposed connective tissue cells to light that mimicked the wavelengths of biophotons. The cells moved toward the light. In another experiment, he blocked light from reaching developing cells and found that they grew in random directions instead of the regular array at 45 degree angles in which they otherwise arranged themselves. Reiner Vogel, a biophysicist at the University of Freiburg in Germany, says the emission may give a very sensitive indication of the conditions within a cell and on the functioning of the cellular defense mechanism. Biophotons might allow us to both read these cellular conditions and influence tissues with new signals. Despite such experimental evidence, diehard skeptics insist that biophotons are simply random background noise from photomultipliers, even if they allow their existence. They claim that they are random emissions and that organisms cannot be using them for intracellular communication. Their efforts to discredit Pop and his work have been effective. Their point of view still pervades the Wikipedia entries for his work and for many of the other approaches described in this book. This has unfortunately impeded the development of medical devices to make use of that discovery that diseased cells have different biophotonic signatures which could be of great benefit for the non-invasive early detection of cancer. The careful experiments of Pop, Albrecht Buckler, and others indicate that coherent biophotonic signals are exchanged between cells and their environments and that these might also be a method of intracellular communication at the speed of light. 
This kind of communication system could send messages simultaneously throughout the body, including to those cells not connected via the neural network, and at a speed many orders of magnitude faster than neural signaling. The resonant melody of creation. Another dent to the notion that electrochemical signaling through neurons is the only or primary signaling mechanism used by the body came from a group of physicists at Denmark's Copenhagen University. They pointed out an embarrassing fact. The physical laws of thermodynamics tell us that electrical impulses must produce heat as they travel along the nerve. But experiments find that no such heat is produced. And by neural bundles, according to Thomas Heinberg, an associate professor at the university, instead Heinberg and his colleague Andrew Jackson propose sound as the mechanism. Other researchers have described single waves called solitron waves as a method of signaling. Soliton waves are different from other sound waves in that they have only one peak and valley instead of a series of them, and this allows them to propagate without spreading out or losing signal strength. Heimberg and Jackson note that nerve membranes, which are made of lipids and proteins, can change from a solid to a liquid state and that these states can impede or facilitate the travel of soliton waves. It's becoming evident that the body has multiple specialized energetic channels of communication. Rather than the slow electrochemical signaling of neurons being the end of the story. The physical channels of meridians if we really have energy flowing in acupuncture meridians throughout our bodies, should we not expect to find some kind of anatomical structure to carry the energy? The acupuncturist diagram of energy meridians does not correspond to any structure described in conventional anatomy textbooks. Scientists have understandably scoffed at the notion of energy flows since when a cadaver is dissected, no acupuncture meridians are found. However, very careful micro dissection is now showing that tiny thread like anatomical structures are indeed present, and they were first discovered running inside blood vessels and are called bonghan ducts. Bonghan ducts are minute tubular structures. They were discovered in 1963 by a North Korean student, Bongham Kin, who stained and traced them throughout the body and concluded that they were the physical channels of the meridian system. Kim's research remained obscure for decades and was not made public by the North Korean government until recently. Only in the 21st century have advanced tissue staining methods become available to trace these tiny thread-like structures more precisely and analyze their anatomy. Recently developed methods such as injecting fluorescent nanoparticles into the lymphatic systems of rats have revealed intriguing details of these channels. Bongham ducts are so small that they are not visible using light microscopes. They are also often surrounded by fibrin strands and are thus easy to mistake for the surrounding tissue. Besides being present in blood vessels, Bongham ducts are also found in lymph vessels and other places. They often contain tiny subducts, and when they divide into these smaller channels, a node is found at the junction. Staining tissues before examining them under electron microscopes has shown that Bongham ducts contain a large amount of DNA, unlike the surrounding tissue. DNA granules appear to flow through the ducts, 
raising the possibility that they might be involved in the healing and cell regeneration process. These DNA granules also differentiate bung and ducts from the surrounding micro tissues. So what do bung and ducts, acupuncture, DNA, and biophotons have in common? Professor Kwansup Saw heads the Biomedical Physics Laboratory at Seoul National University, South Korea. He obtained his doctorate in high energy physics at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island in 1973. For the past decade, his institute has been investigating the physical mechanisms of acupuncture and the meridians. Professor Saw's big insight is that they're all interconnected, and he currently has three teams of exceedingly bright graduate and postdoctoral students working on these research questions. One team studies biophotons, another bong and ducks, and acupuncture meridians, and a third studies biological magnetic fields. However, they all cooperate on papers as an interdisciplinary team of biologists, pharmacologists, physicists, and physiologists. The result has been an outpouring of hard research data linking these fields of study. They study each phenomena as the emission of biophotons from the hands, the propagation of light along the meridians, the similarities between the luminescence emanating from cancer tissues and plant leaves, the effect on the biophotons emanating from mouse brains of change in magnetic fields and other advanced phenomena. One of these studies found bonghen ducts running on the surface of organs, not just inside blood vessels as previously believed. They form a web on the surface of organs. Other studies compare the emission of biophotons from the right and left hands. Professor So has agreed that the mass of DNA that does not code for proteins might be a store of biophotons in the protein exaplexes. Mentioned earlier in this chapter by Professor Bernie Williams and a coherent radiator of light signals, the possibility that DNA, biophotons, and bong and ducts might all be involved with healing opens up intriguing channels of inquiry. Whereas Western research has focused primarily on the nervous system, there are many provocative studies that indicate that the body has multiple signaling systems, some much faster than neural signal transmission. If healing signals do indeed travel through this system, we then have a physical model of how acupuncture, acupressure, EDS machines, and other meridian-based therapies work. Besides its mechanical characteristics, acupuncture is also an electrical treatment. A little known fact about acupuncture needling is that it creates an electrical charge. It does so in three ways. The first is that acupuncture needles are stainless steel with a handle made of a second different metal. Two dissimilar metals in the presence of an electrolyte solution like salt water generate an electrical current. When placed in a salt solution such as a human tissue, the two metals generate a small electrical current electrolically. Secondly, after a few seconds in the body, the tip of the needle is warmer than the handle by as much as 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The differing thermal gradients stimulate a transfer of electrons from one to the other. The tip of the needle becomes positive relative to the handle. However, if the handle is heated, or the needle is twirled as acupuncturists often do, the tip becomes negative relative to the handle. Thirdly, the insertion of the needle as it punctures the skin also creates a piezoelectric charge at the point of contact. When the acupuncture points on the energy meridians are stimulated, 
they send piezoelectric currents through the meridians. Acupuncture points may, in fact, be portals of enhanced sensitivity through which entire meridians can be stimulated. In hundreds of clinical studies, acupuncture has been proven effective for a wide variety of ailments, from reducing the chest pain of heart patients who have been unresponsive to drugs, to the restoration of fertility in men, to the control of chronic tension headaches. Many Western practitioners now also hook up their acupuncture needles to devices that produce a controlled electrical current. A current of one cycle per second, one hertz, passed through acupuncture needles has been shown to raise the level of a patient's beta endorphins, molecules produced in the hypothalamus that aid in pain relief. A recent survey of studies using state-of-the-art fMRI PET, SPECT, and EEG scans show brain centers such as the amygdala and the hippocampus being stimulated by acupuncture. While sham points are not, acupuncture appears to affect a wide network of brain regions including those involving the processing of emotions, thoughts, involuntary actions, and pain. Interestingly, the same effect can be obtained without acupuncture needles. The massage technique of shiatsu or acupressure stimulates acupuncture points with the practitioner's fingers using pressure or tapping. Several energy psychology techniques have the doctor or patient tap on certain points with their fingertip and with correct application are able to produce dramatic and immediate improvements in the patient's emotional state. Acupuncture points conduct electricity even when needles aren't used. Energy Medicine's Ancient Roots Although electromagnetic healing devices may be the newest application of energy and healing, the principles on which they are founded go back thousands of years. The ancient system of acupuncture arose out of the study of qi, literally breath, a metaphor for life energy, or what a modern scientist might describe as electromagnetic energy fields. Ancient Chinese medical practices collected before the first century BCE in a text attributed to the Yellow Emperor describe the cultivation of this life energy or qi. It was thought to be enhanced by various physical postures, movements, and the conscious use of breath. The goal of these exercises was to achieve a trance-like state of relaxation, wherein the qi can be regulated and directed by the mind to correct imbalances in the body. The principles of acupuncture may predate the yellow emperor by thousands of years. The summer of 1991 was one of the warmest in recent European history. During a hike in the Alps, two German tourists, Helmut and Erika Simon, came across what they first thought was the body of a hiker who had succumbed to the glacial ice as had been the fate of several hikers in the previous few years. The Austrian authorities pulled the body loose from the ice, and only when it had been taken to Innsbruck for examination was it realized that this was no ordinary corpse. It turned out to be the mummified remains of an ancient man marvelously preserved in the ice. Radiocarbon dating showed the body to be from the period around 3300 BCE. The study of the body, which researchers christened Otzi, had yielded many fascinating clues about the customs, dress, diet, and beliefs of the period. With him were found his copper axe, bow, and arrows, and dagger. The remains of his hide, coat, grass cloak, leggings, shoes, and loincloth were with the body. Human blood from four different people was discovered on his weapons. A deep cut on his right hand led archaeologists to conclude that he might have been in a mortal fight for survival, fleeing high into the Alps before expiring 
Later examination revealed that an arrowhead had penetrated a major artery and would have led to death in minutes. Otzi was 46 years old at the time of his death and among his physical afflictions were intestinal parasites and arthritis. He also had some 57 tattoos on his skin. Some were dark blue dots, others were plus signs and short parallel lines. Infrared photography also revealed long tattooed lines. But the location of some of the tattoos is fascinating. They correspond with the meridian lines used in acupuncture to treat stomach complaints and arthritis, the very complaints from which Otzi is known to have suffered. The tattoos were either exactly on or within a quarter inch of traditional acupuncture points and meridians. It is thus possible that knowledge of the meridians predates the Yellow Emperor's classic text by thousands of years and was known in prehistoric Europe, China, and probably India. Ancient sages, shamans, developed knowledge of the flow of qi without any of the sophisticated technological measuring tools that we use today. The Indian sage Suruta, writing around 1000 BCE, described prosthetic surgery to replace limbs cesarean sections and cosmetic surgery of the nose he was apparently an expert meditator he is said to have been able to become so still during his meditations and so tuned to his body's signals that he was able to chart the course of the blood flowing through his arteries and draw an anatomically accurate rendition of their locations he wrote a book called Suruta Sambiata, one of the core texts of Ayurvedic medicine. Human awareness of these energy channels along with qi flows is ancient indeed. Methods to enhance the flow may have been part of the knowledge base of prehistoric shamans from many cultures. Of the exercises designed to enhance qi, Tai Chi is one of the most widely practiced in China and the West. It emphasizes large, gentle, slow motion movements as opposed to the abrupt offensive movements of other martial arts. The Yang family's style of Tai Chi, which is the most widely practiced, gained popularity in 1850 when the style's founder, Yang Luchan, was retained by the Chinese Emperor to instruct the Imperial Guard in the art. Adherents practiced Tai Chi by the thousands in parks and public spaces all over China in the mornings. Many believe that it boosts health and increased longevity. A view bolstered by the 2004 Review of Scientific Studies of the subject in the Archives of Internal Medicine and a 2007 study showing that it improves the immune system. Clinical psychologist Michael Mayer, a modern Western Qigong master, says that states of consciousness are expressed in postures, and just as an actor practices stances to enhance the expression of feeling, so does a Qigong practitioner practice his or her stance to maximize power healing, and the expression of intention. Exercise is not associated with sacred awareness for most of us. How many times have you seen someone lifting weights while praying or doing push-ups with reverent mindfulness? Yet in many traditional cultures, exercise and the divine are linked. Constance Grodz, in The Energy Prescription, says that shamans and yogis and qigong Taoists know their spirit energy as the power of life itself and view exercise as a form of active communication with that power. Sustainable exercise, exercise done with somatic awareness, may be the most powerful discipline for conducting spirit energy. It literally saturates our body with regenerating life force from our muscles and bones to our very cells, and it takes our fitness and health to a whole new level. 
mapping the flow of qi in the body for therapeutic purposes, was a primary concern of ancient oriental doctors. They developed an elaborate diagnostic and prescriptive system, without the benefit of any of the tools that we take for granted in the West today. It is a remarkable testament to their powers of observation that so many discoveries on the leading edge of modern scientific medicine are utilizing the same energy pathways that they considered so important thousands of years ago. Whether activated by an exercise regimen like Tai Chi, an electromechanical stimulation method like acupuncture, a biofeedback or EDS machine, energy psychology, or your belief system, the point of therapy is to restore full function and balance to the body's electromagnetic energy system. Frequencies of Healing The uses for electricity in medicine continue to expand. There are some 100,000 EDS machines in use worldwide, utilizing the electrical potential of acupuncture points for diagnosis and treatment. According to the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, some 300,000 patients have permanently installed pacemakers. By way of contrast, in 1959, the Elma 135 was the first pacemaker to be offered for sale. Total number of units sold that year? Two. There are thousands, tens of thousands, of EEG, EKG, and other electromagnetic devices in use. The industry is now estimated to generate about $17 billion a year for the sale of its devices. Transcutaneous Electrical Nerve Stimulation, TENS machines, some oscillating at the same frequency as DNA of humans, employs minute electrical currents to relieve pain and increase electrical energy flow in the meridians. Devices using nanocurrents that act at the level of a single cell are in development. We are calling in spirits that the ancient UT Indians, dancing around their ceremonial fires, illuminating the Colorado prairie with flashes from their quartz rattles, could never have dreamed of. In our book, Soul Medicine, pioneering neurosurgeon Norm Sheely and I devote several chapters to the history and clinical applications of electricity and magnetism in healing. In summary, the picture that is emerging of the mechanisms of healing utilized by these techniques is this. Electricity is generated by either the manual piezoelectric stimulation of certain points, acupuncture, acupressure, energy tapping, by distant electromagnetic fields, by quantum fields, non-local healing, or by an electrical device such as a pacemaker or a TENS unit. Any of these can produce a beneficial change in the body's electrical field and promote wellness. Dr. Sheely, state-of-the-art Sheely TENS, uses the same frequency as human DNA, and he has collected many medical histories documenting the healing of a variety of conditions using electrical stimulation, including hard-to-treat autoimmune diseases. Yet the fact that electromagnetic energy is all-pervasive in life does not answer many important questions. It does not tell us how this force travels, where it goes, or what it does. The answers to these questions lead to some exciting and very new discoveries in an entirely different field of human physiology. Discoveries that have the potential to shake up medicine as dramatically as the overflow of the dogma of genetic determinism.